Welcome to this episode of Eco Insiders, where we dive deep into the fibers of sustainability and innovation in the textile industry today. I'm James Loudon, your host, and with me is my co-host, Richard Sung. Today, we're joined by a remarkable guest, Aliyah Malik, the Chief Development Officer of the Better Cotton Initiative. Alia, welcome to the show. Hi, James. Hi, Richard. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Yeah, really great to have you. And I wanted to first go a little bit back in time, because what we always do here is to ask someone about when they had their aha moments, that moment when they really made a pivot to focus on circularity, sustainability in their career. But it, it feels more like with you as if you had an entire aha career. Yeah. Yeah. I was just reflecting on that as you were speaking. Actually, I don't think there was ever a point when I considered doing anything except for work that was broadly in the space of sustainability. You know, I was raised moving around the world. I was born in the US, but my father worked for the UN. And so we were always exposed to lots of places, lots of cultures, lots of situations. And my family is all involved in sort of social purpose work. And it seemed like a natural thing to do. And when I graduated with my various courses of study, I ended up starting off in East and Southern Africa, working at international development, and things kind of went from there. Yeah. And in your work, it looks like you've always been in a very collaborative kind of team building role. I mean, the word leadership is a big word used all the time, but you've led teams, you've built teams. And what has in those early years, what sort of were moments that sort of helped shape your thinking to how it is to collaborate in a team format and what works well or what didn't work well? An interesting question. In my early part of my career, I was working as an entrepreneur and as a consultant. So I had a lot of a very individual responsibility and accountability. So if you had your own social enterprise, the customers won't buy what you're selling unless it's good and they like it and they believe that it's the right thing and they want it. Or equally, if you're consulting, again, you have to make sure that you're dealing with client needs. And in the last 10 plus years, I've taken that into a much more larger teams context. And I try to instill and build teams around an idea of accountability, that we're trying to move towards outcomes. We need to have clear KPIs. We know where we're going and to have a common sense of purpose around what we're doing. So I suppose the early part of my career was quite formative in shaping the way in which I view working life. You want to get something done. You want to move along. And I have found it to be fun, work with lots of other people to let them see how they can create and achieve in this space. Yeah. And so how do you see that with, let's say, people that you've worked with over time? I mean, is, is it like you really see how someone has evolved from just learning the basics in, in a particular domain expertise and then building up confidence and capabilities as they work you know, in that team? How have you seen certain people around you evolve, younger folks, let's say? I really believe that evolution should be very people-centered and we are all very different. We have really different perspectives, capabilities, skills, personalities. And it's really important to price that in and to see your colleagues and to know who they are, to learn about who they are, and to guess what they could do if you gave them the opportunity. Working with younger colleagues, I spend some energy showing them how I do things and then taking a stepping back approach, doing it then together, that same bit of work. And then from there, I ask them to do it by themselves. And then from there, I hold them accountable for that thing having been done. So it's sort of like moving people on a journey where there's some hand-holding to when they gain their confidence and they know what they're doing, they know how it works, they know why, they know how they do it, seeing they become increasingly independent and able to perform that thing on their own. But I would say everyone is different. And sometimes if you find that people aren't having an easy time in a particular project or team, try out another project, another team, another type of work, another type of role, and see if that gives them the right kind of chemistry to excel and to really contribute. 
Oh, that's really interesting. So it's really also sort of experimenting by having different types of projects and different types of team compositions. And you find that sometimes it needs like more than one time where someone finds their right kind of match within the organization. For sure. Especially because I think this is true probably for all of us. You know, as we started our working lives, we might have not totally correctly identified what it is we were good at, what it is we like doing. And those two things tend to have some relationship. Like if you think of the things that you're most proud of in your professional achievements, they, they tend to be things that you're also very interested in, you re- projects you really enjoy. And so you've got to, from my point of view, I'm very people-driven. You've got to spend time, watch, listen, observe, and adapt, and keep on um, encouraging people to step out of their comfort zones, but not to the point they're uncomfortable, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I'm just to round off this point, and then I'm going to hand off to Richard. What I find fascinating about what you're saying is that it's also coming in more into focus now, considering organizations have gone from very much like analog information driven organizations 20, 30 years ago, where therefore you had a bit more of a hierarchy and less flat structure. And so now it seems like it's essential that people have this overlap between figuring out what they're good at, what they love doing, and also what, say, the organization and the market needs. So what's it called again? The ikigai? <laughs> finding your ikigai. Yeah, finding that nexus where all those things connect. Ali, I believe you have been with Better Cotton for six years now, precisely this month. Could you just share with us what is Better Cotton and what brought you to this journey at first place? Better Cotton is the world's largest cotton sustainability program. And we are a farm-focused cotton sustainability program. So working on improving the sustainability of cotton for farming. And our mission is to help farmers survive and thrive while protecting and restoring the environment. And in practice, we are also a membership body. And we work with the entire industry consuming cotton-based textiles for fashion and textile from retailer and brand all the way through the supply chain, connecting back through the gins to the cotton growers. And we are also standard system. We have a farmable standard and support farmers to improve their sustainability practices uh, practically through a network of partners. And we have 2.8 million licensed growers around the world that are producing better cotton right now. And what attracted you to uh, join Better Cotton six years ago? So as I mentioned, I started off working with agriculture and with rural livelihoods. And that's been connecting thread throughout my career and all the various things that I've done pretty much. I was stepping back from another role that was also working with smallholder agriculture. Again, that was focusing on East Africa. And I got approached in LinkedIn by a recruiter saying, how about this? And, you know, we all get lots of offers on LinkedIn. And I had a read through the terms of reference and it was very complex and complicated. I was looking at all the things they wanted somebody to do. I'm like, that is a very strange collection of asks that they're looking for in this role. But actually, I could do it. I mean, I've had this sort of quite self-styled career path so far and all those things they're asking for happen to be things that I've done so far. And the countries where they're working are countries where I've worked so far. And there are contexts I'm very familiar with. So it felt like a fit. And then when I started engaging with the team and interviewing for the role, I liked them and I found them impressive and fast moving, kind of quite dynamic. It's been a great journey since. I've learned so much. I've grown quite a bit. Plenty of challenges, plenty of stretching moments, but um, it's really been an interesting, exciting six years. I'd love if you could tell us a bit about the whole process that you put in place to build a tracking and tracing system. And if you could just take us through the, the beginning of that until to where it is today. Oh, sure. So I joined Better Cotton initially to work on the program side, so working on the farm-level delivery of the programs through partners and the licensing program. And then a few years in, I was ready to try something different. And also, Better Cotton was at a point where we needed to make some changes. The landscape for legislation have changed very significantly in the past four years. And we'd arrived at a point where 
traceability was considered to be totally essential. And before then, actually, we had stuck with a system called mass balance, where like with you know solar energy on your house, you get a panel and you use solar electricity, but you're not using your solar electricity. You're selling your solar electricity to the grid and you're having energy from the grid. So a system that was more like that. So again, not really tracing the physical movement of the cotton. And cotton is a very complex supply chain. You know, there's this, this idea that a t-shirt travels around the world six times before it reaches the store where you buy it. And it's broadly true. Cotton might be grown in one context and then it has to be transformed a number of times and then it's traded a number of times. So cotton might be grown in Pakistan and it's ginned. So the cotton fiber is separated from the seed in Pakistan and then it might travel outside to get spun in Bangladesh. And then it has to be woven, it has to be cut and dyed and turned to a finished garment. So there's many points of transformation. Unlike something like coffee, where you pick it, you roast it, and then you grind it up and use it. There's many points of transformation. So it was really hard to do traceability meaningfully in cotton. And it was a huge project. One of the things that Better Cotton ended up going for it is because we'd already been doing this mass balance system, we were tracking the movement of those credits as we already had a digital system in place. And of course, we all hear about innovations in traceability technology these days. So there are ways to do forensic tests of materials to find out where they were from. So you can test in principle that is it cotton from Brazil or not from Brazil? And that seems very appealing and potentially like a silver bullet to understanding where cotton is from. But actually in practice, it's a mass commodity produced at huge volumes and implementing systems like that on a mass scale means that it's totally unaffordable. It's not commercially viable. And we built a traceability system that has several different components. There's the digital tracking and the recording of the information stored in a blockchain adjacent technology. But there's also the need to set a system of rules and expectations because actually to meaningfully trace cotton, the whole industry has to change a little bit. And we built a chain of custody standard. So a set of rules that all the supply janitors have to use in order to document what they've kept separate. So say cotton is grown in the US and that it has to be kept aside and it's tracked. And then as it's traded along the way, it has to continue to be segregated away from other cottons if you want to keep the claim that this is 100% better cotton from the US. So it was really building from the ground up and working with uh, north of you know 13,000 actors across the supply chain to onboard them the, the expectation of how they're supposed to keep things separate, how the documentation works, and then training them to continue to input that information into the digital tracking system. And the other component to the traceability system is, of course, checking. So there are plenty of, say blockchain is quite cool. So that's immutable information. Wow, it's preserved forever. But the problem is, what if it's not accurate? What if there's a mistake? What if there's an intentional inaccurate piece of information in there? You actually do need to check. And we have a sort of system in place that we've been building and will continue to build where we have uh, document reconciliation to understand if there are any anomalies and then to flag whether we have in-person audits taking place. Also, all of the actors that are trading traceable cotton on our system, the supply chain actors, have gone through a whole set of self-assessments and external checks. And then from there, our sort of uh, next phase is to also layer in on a risk-based and a randomized way the use of these cool technologies. So like one of the forensic options like I mentioned earlier, where you can check if you ask sort of yes, no question, like is this Indian or Pakistani cotton? And it can say yes, with varying degrees of certainty, but it gives you a little bit more information. So that again, if you apply those on the risk-based and randomized way, you know whether you have to go in and do more a manual check. It's basically a huge operational endeavor, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. That's almost like an understatement. And um, 
considering that just you already hinted at it along the way, what kind of resistance sort of did you encounter and how was that sort of dealt with? You already kind of gave the answer a little bit, but would be interesting just to hear a bit of maybe generically, anonymously, but from stakeholders that resisted at first and how was that then mitigated through the approach? So initially, the most resistant stakeholders were us. <laughs> so at Better Cotton, we had really strategically chosen not to offer traceability because we really wanted to focus our time and our energy and our bandwidth on the work with the farmers, the work providing knowledge and capacity strengthening with farmers around how to do water management, how to reduce chemical pesticides and fertilizers. And we saw this as a huge distraction. Um, so I think the biggest obstacle to overcome was actually our own organization. However, the legislative environment changed and the retailers and the brands were among our most active stakeholders. They totally put their foot down this, you must do this, we need it, it's essential, otherwise this doesn't work for us anymore. And so we said, okay, but we need to partner with you to do this. So we took a multi-stakeholder engagement approach from the beginning, and we brought the retailers and brands into a panel, and they had to contribute funding and also time to work with us to develop a project that was actually suited to the industry's needs. In parallel to that, we're quite connected to the supply chain. So we did a series of consultations, both in person and through our digital platform, to understand about the supply chain's needs and whether they were up for doing this. Because they were the ones that would have to do the work, essentially, to do to do things differently, and it would be disruptive to their trade practices. And so we spent a lot of time asking them in what ways this would be appealing, in what ways they... Um, needed support and how long it would take, whether they actually wanted this. And we did get very clear feedback that actually most saw this as a future reality. And they either were already being asked by their customers or anticipated being asked by their customers for traceable better cotton. So there was a lot of buy-in from the industry to do this. And a lot of the suppliers thought they could manage the transition between in one to three years time. Obviously, varied depending on how sophisticated their operations were. So if they were already using, you know, sophisticated digital systems to manage their business and their inventories, it was a little bit easier. If they were already buying a huge amount of better cotton, so they had mostly better cotton, it was going to be a little bit easier. If they were vertically integrated, so it was a single company taking on several pieces of the transformation of cotton, again, this was easier. So we found, um, we basically developed a really tiered engagement strategy to work with supply chain based on their needs and their starting point. And we continue to adapt it as we go. So you were saying that from the industry, it is something really that they were pushing for. And how does it um, influence sustainable practices for retailers and brands? And how does it ultimately change consumer demand downstream? This is a good question and a very complicated question in a way. So we went live with traceability last November. And from that point, retailers and brands could start to procure traceable better cotton. And what they could do with it in principle is to make membership level claims to say that if we're 90% of the sustainable cotton they're sourcing, and they chose to buy all of that in a traceable sort of pathway, they could say, 90% of our cotton is better cotton and really make a stronger claim that way. There's simultaneously a lot of evolution taking place around what you can make in terms of on-product claims, particularly in Europe. You know, the US is moving a little bit more slowly there and it's more variable in other parts of the world, but there's been a lot of legislation that's been evolving that's still trying to find its resting place around how to avoid greenwashing and how to make claims that are meaningful that consumers can actually understand. Because most claims, the kind of greenwashing sort of review found are actually very confusing. So if you say it's a sustainable this, or it's a green that, or it's an impact friendly this, what does that actually mean? And there's now a lot more rules and a lot more structure around what needs to be true in order for you to say anything on, on a product or on a web page that, that's selling a product. So in the future, a retailer and brand will need to know that the cotton they're buying is physically 
better cotton if they want to make a claim that this t-shirt is 100% better cotton. And so it's really around being on the front foot as that legislation continues to form. So that's one of the things they do get out of it, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. So before I hand off to Richard, I also was made more aware of the um, EU's green directive for green claims regulation. Also because that we had one of our guests who was focused on um, sustainable hospitality. She was on um, two episodes ago, Sarah Hapsberg, and she talked about that. So I, I can imagine that here this is going to be a real game changer when this regulation comes to sort of fully into force or sort of implementation implemented here in the EU. No, absolutely. And, you know, for these huge multinational businesses, everything has to be planned well in advance so that production systems and product sales pathways are known into the future. And the way that the textile sector works, particularly, you know, there's a lot of forward contracts. You kind of agree with, with them. There are different agreements in place, you know, three years beforehand around what volumes or what they want when. And so there's a lot of planning that has to take place in order to make sure that the realities line up with the legislation, line up with the sourcing needs for those products. Alia, you mentioned uh, digital tracking and digital checking earlier. I mean, we ourselves work in the space of digital innovation, so we also work on a digital project. and. Typically, the first thing we look into is to assess whether we have good data or uh, enough data. So going back to your, or your project or your case, how did you ensure the, the accuracy and reliability of the data, given you have so many stakeholders, I imagine, to abstract data from? Ah, yes, this is a good question. You know, with data, you're never looking for 100% confidence, right? But you are looking for a meaningful amount of confidence in the data. And data suffers from many different challenges. There are accidental errors, there are intentional errors, and then there are systems errors. We basically built a system of checks and the degree of confidence that we're aiming for, uh, we haven't yet set that exactly, but it's probably something around you know 85% degree of confidence. So it's not practical because of the huge volume of the data to check every single transaction, and nor is it even feasible because the data originates in less formal environments. I mean, obviously all farming is different. There are huge industrialized farms that are highly mechanized and their things are much more transparent more easily. But if you look at the smallholder context, let's say in Mozambique, you know, let's say there are 3,500 farmers that work in a geographical area and they have a license to be a better cotton production unit. And they are selling to a gin probably owned by a global trader that has supported them with inputs and with trading practices. So they buy that cotton and they know broadly who they are and they know broadly who the actor is. And so that that's, it should be more or less the right people and the right cotton. But to know for sure exactly how much cotton every single smallholder produced for totally accurately, very difficult. And actually in smallholder agriculture, people are always moving in and out of farming. So some years it makes sense to plant cotton. Some years it doesn't. Some years they decide, actually, I'm going to go to the city and then my brother's going to take over my farm. You know, there's a lot of movement and a lot of change. It's a very fluid situation. So keeping all of the information accurate is really very challenging. One of the ways that we're working on that is for the smallholder context, we're looking at moving towards a more landscape analysis of who are the better cotton growers. So certifying an area for better cotton production rather than individual smallholder farmers. And then another big challenge is just the nature of blending, especially coming back to the smallholder case. So say Indian smallholder has one hectare farm and they have produced some cotton. <laughs> you know, that cotton then goes into a larger lot with lots of other farmers, and that one goes into a bale. And then that bale is received at the gin, and the gin will want to produce an even product for their next customer. So they're going to mix it with many other lots in order to make sure that it is um, a smooth quality reasonably, and that they've balanced their commercial needs. So say 
They bought it a little bit higher for one group, a little bit lower for another. They want to have an even kind of pricing situation as well. So already at that one node, there's already been so much mixing taking place. And that will happen again when the bale of cotton is turned into a spun fiber. It's also about being realistic about the data points that you can capture because perfect traceability to the smallholder is probably never really going to be possible, implementable on a large scale without dramatically changing the cost of cotton. But you want to get the right amount of traceability, an amount that is viable and that you can reliably collect and that is reasonably accurate. So that's one way we tackle that. But of course, I think you're probably asking more about how we do it from the other side. And I mentioned that we have an integrity process where we are doing a lot of documentation checking, and we also have a system of risk-based audits taking place. So we send auditors into the field, into the supply chain actors factory to check that things are as they say. So to watch how the cotton is processed, to ascertain whether that is true, they even could keep things separate as they said they would. And then we are going to experiment further with the higher tech options where you do forensic style testing on the material to understand some characteristics of its origin and try to match that up with the paper trail. Yeah, that's a very, let's say, a high level of complexity, data complexity. And I am wondering how this technology involvement or emerging technologies support the challenges you just mentioned. I mean, AI has been hot for one year or two years. And you also mentioned blockchain earlier. What's your opinion on like solving these challenges with the technology and how you evaluate different technologies? For instance, we were working on another project where we were considering to use, uh, you know, machine vision OCR to recognize people's handwriting so that it can be automatically locked into the system in a way to at least accumulate data point. So I was wondering if you also evaluate like different uh, technologies to kind of support uh, or to help with some challenges you you just mentioned? Well, we've done some experimenting with technologies. So our original system, I mentioned we had a digital tracking system in place for our credit trading system, has been around for ages. And we assumed that because the industry had moved on so significantly, there's been a plethora of new digital tracking systems developed with all sorts of interesting bells and whistles, like as you mentioned, you know, handwriting recognition, you know, incorporating other features. And so we did a year-long pilot with some request for proposals and a tendering process. And we found what we thought were the best in class SaaS providers of digital platforms. And we tried with two of them applying to practical situations in Indian supply chain. We involved, I think, four plus retailers and brands, a number of supply chain actors, and we just tested out how it actually worked in using these other technologies compared to what we had. One of the things that we found was that actually, I keep on talking about the complexity of cotton and that it's commodity, that it's price sensitive, but actually for cotton and for our stakeholders, simple was better. So when we did analysis of the pilots post-pilot, the shinier, newer platforms were very good, had a very nice user experience, good features, retailers and brands like them. However, for the supply chain actors, they generally preferred our more analog offering, partially because it was familiar, partially because it just made a little bit more sense and it was more, and the user experience had been more focused on them. So I guess what we found was that less change was better when we were asking for other like process changes alongside. So it was less for us, our traceability project was less about technology than we assumed it would be. And that I've mentioned how we're also tried using different kind of alternative tracer system. So, you know, where you spray on fluorescent materials and then you can read that along the journey. And we tried, there there are a few different technologies that do things like that. What we found was actually, again, because cotton's a commodity and it's in these very diverse situations, that, that actually the operations issues were the main issues. And so in some cases, they hadn't yet gotten secure import licenses so they couldn't get the technology there in time. In other cases, there were functionality and training issues so that there were mistakes made or the um, 
blue fluorescent tracer applications were read by the processing machines as contamination. I mean, they were they were really like analog problems trying to apply those solutions. And then also, they were not use cases where that could easily be done on a risk-based or randomized way and applying it to all cons, simply not practical. Too expensive, too onerous, too operationally burdensome. So I guess where we landed was that actually we needed to use the most clear and simple technology layers possible onto existing systems people were already using such that it was more about changing the practices behind keeping things separate that they could focus on. Yeah, just to kind of tag on to what Richard and you were just talking about with also working with technologies and vendors, I was just curious about how in general the business ecosystem, I mean, is organized or evolving around BCI's program. So for example, there are startups with great technologies and, and sort of great solutions. There are corporates that our key partners, and then there's academic research that's ongoing. And how does that all kind of come together? Is there a kind of a place where the latest thinking and best practices are sense checked or yeah, anything that you'd like to share on that? I'm just curious about how business ecosystems are interacting with BCI. Yeah, interesting. We have been partnering with um, an organization that is doing some checking on the fit between technologies and these real world challenges. And we've done some pilots also with them. We've, we've been a bit involved in pilots that they've also done to see whether some of these technologies, whether the use case is there. And the lessons echo what I was just mentioning, which were that for most of these startup technologies, there were some promising directions for the future. But in many cases, either the degree of confidence was too low. Like there's one leading technology provider that's only offering a 50 degree percent confidence, which is not very high and only allowing the answering of very binary questions. So the limitations are still quite significant. If that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's interesting that you talk about when changing a process is a big thing and then also changing a technology at the same time is just too much to ask. Or is that, that's kind of one generic insight I'm taking away from this. I think that's, that's a good conclusion. Change the process was actually the most important thing. So change the technology turned out to be more of a distraction. Yeah. I would love to kind of go back to the start when you were initially speaking to Better Carbon Initiative about some of their challenges. You know, okay, look, there's a lot of interesting challenges here, and actually I can start to work on them. And then you moved from, after a few years, you moved into the role of building up the data and traceability. And now you've got a, a kind of a broader oversight role. And I'd love to just understand a bit about your reflections when you sort of six years ago, what are things that you thought, well, these things we can tackle, we can get these done in the next five or 10 years, and that were harder in hindsight to overcome. Or maybe there are also other things that were like, well, this is going to be a hard challenge, but actually we've made a lot more progress on this than we would have expected initially. It's more just a reflection on the last six years as we're looking at now the rest of this decade before we switch our lens towards the future? One of the things working in this particular organization that I've, I've enjoyed is there's always a high level of aspiration around what we might do. We're very moonshot-ish in our target setting. When I first joined, it was really around growing. We we're still a mainstreaming chapter where we were trying to grow to be big enough that it was meaningful and big enough that sustainable procurement in fashion and textile could be the norm. And so we had all of these reach targets around reaching 5 million farmers and reaching a certain percentage of volume of cotton please, globally and the amount of uptake by the retailers and the brands. Those targets, the way we set them, we, we had, they were moonshots. And so they weren't achievable in their actual numbers, but they did actually help us around the trajectory that we're looking for. And I think it's sort of unpicking whether you're taking a target as directional or a target as um, as literal, if that makes sense. So I think where the targets were seen literally, you know, you could feel a little bit stressed. But actually, you know, we targeted then to reach 5 million and the terms of particip participating farmers were up to about 3.2 at that point. We have a, a smaller subset that are licensed to sell better cotton, 
But um, that's like an amazing achievement. And, you know, we're now at a quarter of the world's cotton production in terms of who we're covering and how much volume is there, which is really significant. And we have actually reached the purpose behind our goal, which is to make sustainable procurement of cotton practical, manageable, and a norm in fashion and textile. Most of the retailers and brands we work with have 100% sustainable sourcing targets, which they can manage for cotton. And then I think similarly with the traceability project, that one seemed so daunting at the outset because of the complexities that I've been mentioning. But when we took it apart piece by piece and you know, we collaborated with the industry to get funding behind the project development, we worked with and we built a great team of very practical people that managed a very well-organized, orderly, well-run project to pilot and to build and to build all the component parts. So what was achieved there and what, where we are right now is well beyond the expectations of the organization several years ago. So that was really heartening. And then looking to 2030, we are really trying to move better cotton to take our big platform to deepen the impact. So we have targets around 50% reduction in GHG and in pesticide use, for example, across the whole platform of cotton growers that we work with. And that is a really ambitious target, but 50% is the number that we'd need to achieve if we're going to all stay within the 1.5 degree planetary thresholds. So we said, okay, I mean, 30% we felt like we probably could do, but 50% was actually needed. And so from there, we're still in a very active period of thinking of how we're going to change because you can't deliver what you delivered yesterday. The same process will produce the same outcome. You have to change if you want a different outcome. And so we're in this change and innovation chapter. And my remit at the moment is really looking more broadly at our field programs and how we can evolve and adapt so that we have a, a chance to move towards those targets that we've set for ourselves. Fascinating. It's like The evolution of the organization, you know, your personal evolution and the team has been one that's a mix between kind of tangible achievements, but also now what you're talking about is sort of this preparation for this sort of very adaptive mindset. So you're more adapting to changes in the field. And I was just thinking about, we're talking about BCI and your work. Meanwhile, the global environment has also evolved around. And so there's new regulations that are coming out. And there are, for example, more, I think, Gen Z in the workforce globally now than there are baby boomers. So there are a lot of younger people that are also having a different approach to work, also perhaps more embraceive of new technologies or approaches or process changes, if you will. How do you see the landscape around you? And you were talking about, you know, reducing pesticides. So I'm thinking there are then overlapping intersecting points with other groups that are providing alternative approaches to maintaining soil health. So just a few questions there about how kind of how the interaction with the global landscape as it's changing, how that looks like. That's a very complex, essentially. Much harder than traceability, I think, because there's also so many different groups. There are so many different countries. There are so many different grower profiles. And then everywhere that we work, all the different countries, there are different landscapes of other actors that we partner with to work on these topics. So let's say in one place, people might really prioritize the mindset of reducing pesticides. In another place, and let's say the local legislation also bans the same pesticides that we ban at Better Cotton. But in another place, the growers might have a more traditional mindset and the legislation hasn't yet tackled the pesticide issue, even if it's tackling other elements of climate change. So there's not an easy operating environment where people have a common understanding of what you want to do. So depending on where you're starting, you need to get the right partners that already have relationships with the growers to start the conversation because it's a conversation. And farmers in almost all situations are individual businesses. You know, that's their livelihood. And if the crop fails because they don't protect it how they see then that's their livelihood not there that year. And crop insurance is not widely available or accessed by farmers. You know, there are some countries where it's very common and some countries where it's not. Say in the UK, for example, farmers don't really get crop insurance. 
And so if things don't work out, there's no income that year. So it's working with people around a very sensitive part of life where they will naturally feel resistant to change unless they can see that the farmer next door has reduced their chemical inputs and reduced their costs and still has a decent yield. So you have to have a see it to believe it situation. So everything in the agriculture space takes time. So you need to have, you know, leaders and demonstrations and information sharing and then support for when things go wrong. There's just so many layers to it. Yeah, exactly. We can go on for a long time about this. I'd love to, but I'm I'm realizing we don't have that. So we're going to have to uh, slowly wrap up. But I would love to ask you for people that are, say, graduates or about to graduate from university or some form of technical training, um, about to enter the workforce, who are our listeners or people that are mid-career or in in a leadership role, just pretty much in any phase, but going into a career in sustainability. Now, sustainability kind of sounds very broad, right? But I think what seems to be clear is it's always around aligning stakeholders. There's a lot of stakeholders and there's a lot of flexibility and adaptive thinking needed. I just wondered if you could share kind of some advice for people that are looking to enter the career in it or make a big pivot. The advice that I would give is work on something that you are genuinely interested in. Because no matter what profession you're in, especially if you're in a profession that rewards you, I mean, yeah, you get paid all right, but the reward is also around your values, around your purpose, around your contribution to human progress and environmental well-being. You need to also make sure that it works for you and that you are learning and you are feeling challenged. I think that you should never lose sight of how it actually feels to you. I mean, because there are plenty of things and I happen to find agriculture super interesting. I am not equally interested in everything else. And so I get a lot out of this. It's a really enjoyable journey. I bring curiosity to the space. And I think that I've continued to learn and grow and develop professionally because I'm genuinely very engaged. So I think it's to sort of stay centered in personal truth. Really fascinating. Really great to speak with you today. And I have one more question before we wrap up, which is, If you could recommend a book, a movie, an article, or a course that you think it would be really helpful people to dive into. I might make two recommendations. And there are plenty of others I would make, but these are the ones that come to mind. I think that people should read the absolute classic, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, just talking about the chain of cause and effect, our natural world, our interference in our natural world. And I also really enjoyed, I did a master's at Cambridge in development studies. and. I had a professor, you know, he's got quite a strong point of view, writing interesting books, and his name is Hajun Chang. And he writes about kicking away the ladder. So the idea that actually to make changes in the society, you have to intervene. You know, you can't just let the market forces play out. You have to actually get involved. Governments have to get involved. People have to get involved. In. And, you know, one of the ways that he saw that trade legislation was evolving at that point, that a lot of the tools that today's industrialized countries have used in order to climb up their ladder of industrialization have become not possible anymore in global trade legislation. I just found the narrative of those power structures and the flexibility that's given to developing countries today versus the journeys that people have done before. You know, obviously, we need to also balance the planetary needs with that as well. But it's really interesting I thought it's a point of reflection around the role of government. I think there's a big role for government. And that's a wrap of our conversation with Alia Malik, who I thank deeply for her insights and time today. We hope the discussion helped trigger new thoughts for you. And if you have any questions or feedback, please share them with me and Richard. You can find all our details in the show notes. And don't forget to give us a five-star review on your podcast platform. If you like what we do, it helps us to get more traction in this new show. One more thing. If your organization is looking to unlock new perspectives or bridge existing ones, get in touch with us. We help companies with research and workshops, leveraging our team and our expert ecosystem. Bye for now and see you at episode nine, which I'm still counting with my two hands.